Broadmoor, a word that makes people shiver. Most think that Broadmoor is a prison. In fact, it's a high secure psychiatric hospital and home to some of the country's most dangerous and violent offenders. After five years of negotiation, and for the very first time, the hospital has allowed cameras in to meet the men who live behind these walls. history about people being all these monsters here basically but it can be violent but that don't mean you're a bad person because sometimes you don't you're not intending it. Hello Bravo one zero Gunner. One going to the Phoenix OC with its call radio alpha four over the easiest reaction in the world is to see somebody that has committed something atrocious, label them as evil, want to lock the door and throw away the key. I've probably actually never said the words of what I've actually done, I've never admitted it. It's still just a blur in my head. I got born into a satanic family, very, very violent. In some cases it would have been better to have killed me than to allow me to have this abominable life that I've had. With unprecedented access and filmed over a year, this series reveals the secrets of life inside Britain's most notorious institution. Broadmoor is perched above the Berkshire village of Crowthorn, just 40 miles from the centre of London. When people think of Broadmoor, they think of Ronnie Cray, Peter Sutcliffe, Robert Knapper and Kenneth Erskine some of the most dangerous killers the country has ever known. The public perceived this place as, oh, that's where the Yorkshire Ripper is locked up. That's where Rachel Kell's killer is locked up. Broadmoor is an institution of lots of people, but not all rapists, paedophiles or murderers. There is people in here for self-harming, in prison. There's people in here for burglary who then got ill in prison and there's people in here for very, very evil things and the brushes will all the same brush which they shouldn't do. First built as a Victorian lunatic asylum for the criminally insane, today Broadmoor is an NHS hospital. Over its 150 year history, it's been a secretive and mysterious institution. Staff are under strict instructions not to discuss patients outside the hospital walls. Thank you much. Many won't even admit to working here. Close, close family members know that obviously where we work. Um, but if we're in the normal mainstream, then you would you would probably say you work in the hospital or something. We don't really talk about the place. Listen, if you said that you worked in Broadmoor, you'd just spend the whole of the day or the afternoon with a barrage of questions about the place, so it's just easier to say you work for the NHS. They're told not to share personal information with the patients either, and to leave their private lives along with their possessions at the front door. Broadmoor's most notorious patients, like Peter Sutcliffe and Kenneth Erskine, have chosen not to participate. But many of the men here have been front page news and are vilified by society. This is the first time they've been allowed to tell their stories. I've done everything from taking hostages, multiple hostage taking, stabbings, you know, uh, multiple assaults, violent assaults, fire setting. I, I set hot fos um, a fire in a hospital, um, psychiatric hospital, the first one I ever went to. Um, yeah, it's mainly violence, and my, my, my history is mainly violence. Broadmoor's 200 patients are all men suffering from mental disorders. They're classified as vulnerable adults, and only those who have capacity to give consent have been allowed to talk to us. Their faces have been blurred to protect.
protect their identities. What do you like when you're not on medication? I'm, I'm quite a nasty person. I'm, I'm quite violent, or very violent in most most circumstances. Very antisocial. I don't like spending time with people. Um, paranoid. I'm a lot very paranoid. Every every person is around me, thinking what's their intention. And I come like sometimes I come very close to attacking people because I'm thinking that they're going to do something to me, and I don't want to get hurt first. Um, I remember one time without my medication, I spent, I think it was like 11 months locked in a cell, segregated due to the fact that I was too dangerous to come out. 24-year-old Alex arrived at Broadmoor seven months ago. He was serving a life sentence in a dedicated prison unit for highly dangerous prisoners. They could no longer manage him. When I was younger, yeah, we chased a seagull all around my council estate, right? Yeah. With a box, because I had a broken... Now on an admissions ward, He's been diagnosed with mental illness and personality disorder and put on medication. One of his symptoms is auditory hallucinations. He hears voices. I, uh, I was doing a fruit salad the other day for an assessment. I had to make, do this assessment for um, personal motor, motor um, skills, it's like for learning disability. And um, I was cutting a mango, and I've never, I've never used a sharp knife. In the seven years I've been away, I've not used a sharp knife. And I was shaking, literally, I've nearly cut my fingers off, because the voices were telling me to attack the people in the room with the knife. And uh, they were goading me into it, and I thought, I can't do that, I can't do that. So I managed to finish fruit, the fruit salad, and I felt, wow, like, what achievement. Because most sorry, honest, most sorry, a year ago, two years ago, I might have, most I would have done it, you know? It's dirty. It's dirty. How much? No. It's dirty though. No, we will clean it afterwards. But we want to give you bedding for now, yeah? yeah. This is Cranfield, the intensive care ward, home to the hospital's most acute mentally ill patients. Okay. I'll Can you come in? Sit on the bed for us then. Any contact with them has to be carefully planned and executed. This is a six-person unlock. The door to this patient's room can only be opened with six staff present. What are you, man? What are you, man? Please. There's always the risk of violence towards others. You have to accept that, you know, they've got a chronic uh, mental illness and they will be very disturbed throughout the day, but you have to learn to work with them. I focus when working with these guys. It's actually telling them that they're here not because of the illness, they're here because of violence. And they'll only progress from here if there's a reduction in that violence. So that message, you know, it might take time, but gradually over a period of time, it starts going through. On this ward, even the most routine tasks run a risk of violence and involve a protocol. This patient has asked for a drink. Just give us a minute. She's going to get a cup, okay? Yeah, baby. Shukran, shukran. Shukran means thank you, right? You know, you told me all this. Casablanca. That's the cup. Right. I've got your baby here. Did you go sit down? No, the one at the back, all right? You need some more? I've got a house there for you, okay? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Life in Broadmoor can be a game of snakes and ladders, with patients moving between the hospital's 15 wards according to their mental state. Patients who are responding to treatment can progress to one of the hospital's assertive rehab wards where they're given greater freedom. Daniel is one of 12 patients on this ward. I've been here five years. Luckily I never went to a higher dependency ward, I came straight to a rehab. And to be honest it's been, well, I wouldn't use the word wonderful because yeah, it's not wonderful, but I've been grateful basically to come here. 
in my spare time, I try and engage in artwork mostly. This was the uh, my first real attempt at an actual portrait, all done completely in graphite. And then I moved on to using charcoal along with uh, graphite. And the charcoal allows you to, to have so much more uh, depth in the tonal quality. And then, yeah, I did a self-portrait. The whole, the whole picture was a statement about when I got locked up when I was 14 and I'm now 24. This is me at 24, but that's me back then sort of thing. Mental disorder is no respecter of class or education. Daniel was a 14-year-old boy at a mainstream school and no one anticipated the violence of his attack on his own family. All of the men in Broadmoor present a grave and immediate risk to the public, and many have committed violent crimes, from arson to torture, rape and murder. Unlike a prison sentence, they have no release date. I've been a bit of a conundrum for the psychologist, and I've had about nine different diagnoses from 30 different doctors. I've had seminars about me done, I've had people wanting to write books about me, just because of the unusuality of, of my offence and my age and what happened. I mean, my family are my saving grace, to be honest, you know, they're, they're, they're hugely, hugely supportive. And what's even more amazing is that my offence was actually orientated against my family, sort of thing. So the fact, and, and what a lot of people see is that when a family member has committed an offence against a family member, they often dis disown them, sort of thing, you know, it's, it's, it's too much for the family, but they, they, they told me that they swore they'd stay by me when they, when they was christened, and they have, sort of thing, you know. I, I, they've, always, they've always agreed I've had Asperger's. One of the problems I have is I'm not very good at understanding emotions, or if I have a, if I'm feeling something, I don't always understand what it is that I'm feeling, but if I can draw it, I can get out these angry feelings or, or these frustrations of being locked up or guilt or remorse and all these all these negative feelings I, I can channel through this imaginative artwork sort of thing. SB9. Ah. I've probably actually never said the words of what I've actually done, I've never admitted it. Not for you. Because I still I still get flashbacks. It's mainly guilt. I still, I still struggle to bring it to mind. It's still just a blur in my head, and oh, I've done such a terrible thing. That's one of the things that I've got to come to terms with eventually. Is that I've done this. It's happened, and it will be with me forever. We're not allowed to reveal the details of Daniel's offence. Okay. Um, the only thing I was wondering about was I sort of get problems with fine motor control and spatial awareness, things like that. Like bumping into things and dropping things a lot. As you say, it's not one of the most common side effects. In fact, the opposite is being very popular. Daniel is taking medication and undergoing psychological therapy. These, together with everyday interaction with staff, are the cornerstones of the treatment here. Have you noticed any benefit? I don't really know what it is I'm looking for. I have noticed a difference on you not over the last two weeks, but certainly over the last three months. I think that you are much more able to spend longer time with people on one-to-one -one situations. Broadmoor can feel like a ghost town. Patients can only move at certain times and in certain configurations. And cameras record where each patient is at any given moment. Hello, Alpha, the control room ensures that incompatible patients do not collide. Patients who are well enough leave their wards to go to work, study, and even once a week go shopping. It's strangely like a village. The freedom to shop is a mixed blessing. 
One of the side effects of medication is increased appetite and many patients are severely overweight. However normal it feels, the reminder of the threat of violence is ever present. Searches looking for potential weapons are carried out before any patient movement. This is stuff that we've retrieved from patients. Okay, this is uh, just what used to be a CD and it's been broken up into shards. It can be used as a blade, even self-harming. In fact, we, we don't use the CDs here anymore. We've got spoons and forks that have been sharpened off on the edge. So a, a normal teaspoon, plastic spoon, which is quite innocent to you and I, has been fashioned off and, and can be used as a potential weapon to stab. And it's just an example of how vigilant we have to be with everyday items. I've done a lot of self-harming, as you can see. Cut my own throat a couple of times. Cut my throat like four times, I think. Um, funny enough, part of it, I think it was about five weeks before I come out, I hung myself. And um, they had to do CPR on me in, in the cell, like, you know. When I was a child, and that had an effect on my behaviour, on my mental state, like, I couldn't sleep at night and all the rest of it. I was, you know, basically everything you go through when you've had a traumatic situation like I did. I think as well that being is, I said to my mum, this feels like the best I've ever been in 10 years. Patients that come here, they will have perpetrated often horrendous crimes, but they are also victims. And it is very easy to see somebody as either the perpetrator or the victim. It is much more difficult to understand that somebody might be both. Patients from different wards meet at certain events. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving up your time because we know you could be doing other things and we have a lot of different work streams and a lot of Today is a diversity workshop and poet and lawyer Dave Nita is encouraging them to celebrate their different cultures. We're going to invite you to speak about your own culture. But before that, we're going to have lunch. But most of them are celebrating lunch. No alcohol or tobacco allowed. Food is the only thing they have free reign over. My mum's Italian and my dad's from a little island in Africa. And I like to say that being more cultural, it helps, you know, and it's good. It's, it's nice to be different because different is what we need. We don't want everything the same. And that's it. Oh, how did I end up in here? Um, they said I had, they had a spare bed, so I thought, well, I've been in children's homes, I've been in security units, I've been in prison. The only place I haven't been is Broadmoor, so I thought I'd come along. <laughs> now 26, Declan was put into care at the age of nine. I remember the day my mum took me to his office, and I was sat there on a the chair, and next minute she just left. She went, you're not coming with me. And the social worker come out and she went, oh, you've got to come with me. I went to children's homes, foster homes. I kept running away because I got abused when I was in the children's home by the staff, sexually and physical. And um, I think it was like no one would actually listen to me. I ran away to London. I was living on the streets. So, you know what I mean? I was living out of bins. Yeah, not nice, but when you're on the streets, you have to do that sometimes, you know what I mean? Yeah, guys, this is called Think, yeah? And it goes like this. When you see a tramp out on the street, don't look down your nose so far, you see your own feet. When you see people homeless, don't reach for a group. Consider if you have the means to give them a route. And my victim, me and my co-defendant, um, basically stabbed them up. The judge classed it under as torture. As long as I know that I'm black and British, and I'm proud of it, and that's me, yeah. You say you've got a chance? Mm-hmm. Got a little boy, he's seven. He's, he lives with his mum. Don't really see him. But I wouldn't I wouldn't expect children to come in a place like this. And are you still on good terms with his mum? 
Um, <laughs> not really, no. I was started having a bit of a relationship with So, yeah, that was the first time I uh, found out that I was sort of that way. I always, for some reason, I've always wanted to be a woman. I think that's the way I want, do you know what I mean? But in this place, you can't do that. They won't allow it. And uh, I just want to say that I'm gay and I'm proud of it. Thank you. I want to be a drag queen, that's what I've done for a while. What's she called? Crystal. And what's she look like? Blonde and just fabulous. <laughs> uh, We've come to Chepstow, a medium dependency ward where Lenny wants to show us his artwork. You do it in your own? Yeah, I do it with all my spare pens and waste, waste um, pens and bits and bits, you know, using cups for the shapes and bottle tops for, to draw around. How long have you been here? Seven years or so. Is it not your first time? No, it's the second time. What do you think of that one? That's the corridors in, in the walls that are shut down now. So why are you considered at risk? Um, because I think my, my particular offence was against a consultant psychiatrist. Uh, they call them section, section 12 approved psychiatrists. And they're very powerful. They're not, like, not like when you go to ordinary doctor, they, they work for the home office. He's not happy with life in Broadmoor and tells us he's bringing a high court case against the hospital. Cost, I don't know how much it, what was the last figure that they said it cost to keep us here every year? Is it £320,000 a year or something? Surely it's, it's, it's wrong to charge a fortune for people like us when it would be nowhere near the amount of settlers in the community. It costs £300,000 a year to keep a patient in Broadmoor. Almost five times the cost of keeping someone in prison. Before Lenny came to Broadmoor, he was an outpatient at a psychiatric hospital where he threatened his psychiatrist with a machete. But do you think I sound like a bad, bad an idiot? Because I think, well, no, I don't think I should be. I think I should be sharing this of my life with other people. I want, I want to share my life with other people. I want to be able to get up in the morning and decide when I have a shave, uh, what I do when I do it, and be reasonably responsible for my behaviour, like everyone else out there. And I don't think I'll be any more of a danger than whatever is already out there. And I will be honest with you, I, I am rude here. I, I can be really furious and angry. You become your the patients, yeah? That is a term we use to separate you from the rest of society. We're the last thing on earth, this is the truth here, to be given what you call equal rights. What do you think? Do you agree or not? I'm not anti people, I'm all for people. Downstairs on the admissions ward, Alex is keen to progress. I was seven months up in here until yesterday. Seven months yesterday. It's taking forever. Are you aware of any beds coming up soon? His medication has stabilised him. He wants to move from admissions to an assertive rehab ward, where he'll have greater freedom. That I don't know. You should know you're a consultant on there. <laughs> Oh. Yes, I, I, can't, I don't know the time scales because it's not quite within my control. Back upstairs on Chepstow, Benson, the pat dog, has arrived for his weekly visit. Lenny's behaviour over the past few days is becoming a cause for concern. He's been increasingly manic and hyperactive and his doctor feels he needs medication. Lenny refuses to take it, so it would have to be forcibly administered by injection. Hang on, hang on, feel me. Feel me. Yeah. Hey, well, yeah. you have to get on me, not to touch me. I don't want you to be at risk if you guys just please. Don't touch me. This is wrong. I'm not fighting you. We don't want to fight you. It's not for your for your business. It is, it is. Mark, you have the wrong fight me. At this point, staff tell us to leave the ward. We're told we can see Lenny the following day. Neil, Neil, can we have a key please? Make sure you don't open anyone in there. Open. The day before, 
We were told to leave the ward when staff were about to forcibly inject Lenny with antipsychotic medication. Anyone down there? He's keen to explain what happened after we left. He leads us into the seclusion area. Come in, come in. Right, well, I was here, and I was, first of all, I was like that way, and I was laying like this. Right, and I was trying to say, please don't turn me over, Mark. Because I'm not trying to fight you, and then they said, well, you're going to get it. And then the next thing happened, they all came in, they twist and turned me. I didn't make a deal with them on the bed. So I was like this, at one point, like that. All start started holding me, I was like that. And I said, would you please let me go, and I'll get up. So I went like that, so okay, then I had to give it. So I went like this, stood like that. I took down my pants and trousers and they stuck me there. That's it, and I came out again. That's what happened. But I didn't. What do you think? So, what's your opinion about that? But did you? So, did you hit? You hit one of them. Yeah, but that's because I've been chased off here. One of the biggest areas of conflict um, between certainly doctor and patient is the issue of medication. This is all sealed, right? It's stifling here sometimes. One of the difficulties with psychotic disorders is your interpretation of reality is different from other people's. If you, if you genuinely believe there's nothing wrong with you and you don't need any medication, why on earth would you want to take some of the medications that would be up for discussion? He's particularly angry for two reasons. So one is he doesn't believe he'll benefit from the medication at all. The second reason is that he believes he's involved in a major high court case against the hospital to expose a range of malpractice, particularly in relation to him, but in general, about how these services are just really keeping people in jobs and don't provide any useful service. The, the hospital's defence is just, he's with some of the most notorious people in the country. I'll show you what He believes we've given him the medication purely to dull his mind and weaken his chances of being successful in that case. In fact, he's not currently involved in any uh, legal action or court case. No, he's not going in there, sorry, it's private, can't he? He goes private. That's my mess, my mess. Hey, look, can you show my mum? Yeah. Look at that, that's my mum, that's my mum and me. She, she's pretty in a black and white when she's didn't see it. He's a man who spent a long time in institutional care um, in previous settings, was frequently assaulted. He was violent himself on several occasions, but he was often assaulted. Do you want a drink or anything? A cup of tea or something? Fine, thank you. Are you sure? Anything to the soft drink? Nothing. Right, thank, you very, thank, very you very thank you very much. Sorry to have to break There are 11 other people, by the way. Thank you very much. Check to make sure all the shadows are covered. So they checked that the first thing in the morning, again, before the patients go back. Patients who are well enough to go to work can make goods which go on sale to the public. They're paid 80 pence an hour. Alex has been doing well and is now allowed off the admissions ward to come to work. Everyone saying, oh yeah, you're going to move, you're going to move. They said I would have moved by Thursday last week. Nothing's found out. I've been on, on to my psychiatrist saying, look, why, why am I still on an admission ward after eight months when there's a bed for me on Ria? No? A bit frustrating. Yeah, it is frustrating, but I'm just at the moment focusing. Next week I've got a visit. Mum and Dad are coming up for two days. So, you know, I'll spend some time with my family. They have a saying here there's time, and then there's Broadmoor time. Which episode did you see last of these tenders? Last. About a week night. ago. Last night. Last night, yeah. Yeah, so what, did they show them um, the man who was pretending to be Nick Cotton's um, son? No, I didn't see it. While medication can often control behaviour, extensive therapy is needed to change it. And that takes time. I'm in the diary, okay? Okay. Estelle Moore is the hospital's lead psychologist. She's been here for 20 years. Right. We'll say just carry on with the violent offenders group. What we'll finishes in December. Okay, right then. Patients undergo specific therapies depending on their offence, whether it's violence, sex offending, or fire setting. Um, I understand the relationships and uh, borderlines. No, not borderlines, boundaries. What sort of actions are safe and contained in relationships? The sorts of things that you would do that feel like normal and safe relationships? Laughter. Laughter is yeah. okay. So laughing, 
talk and sensible, feel comfortable with each other. Declan was found guilty of a life-threatening assault on a man. Do I feel sorry for him? No. He'll do it again, no. No. I'm missing the sun, I'm missing the surfing. Lenny has been on antipsychotic medication for a few weeks. He's had time to build up in his system. Now he's had the depot injection, the chemicals from that are slowing down his reaction to the point where he has those few more seconds to think, how am I going to reply to this? And he will reply in a much more manner to what you or I would reply to something. I could definitely empathise with them. He hasn't come from a different background to me, but he has come from different parents to me. It seems to be the case with so many. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. I've, you, you can probably see, if you go back into um, the lives of most of our patients, you could probably identify them at five, six years old and say, I'll be seeing you later on and things like that. Everyone is born with certain temperaments, with certain predispositions to certain behaviour. And if you've been given a triple whammy of, of genes, environment, upbringing, childhood adversity, substance misuse, all of those different aspects build up to make the person. And it's a long-term project of gradually putting somebody back together and making sure that they stay in that recovered state. Things have finally changed for Alex. After eight months, he's been moved to assertive rehab. It's better over here. It's a lot better. Got a lot more freedom. Key to the door. Come out when you want, make hot drinks. Yeah, it's all right. But it's not all good news. As so often in the past, he's in danger of self-harming. He's had to be put on eyesight observation, which means nurses have to take turns to watch him 24 hours a day. Because my mental state hasn't been the best. It's not nice, you know, hearing voices and what have you, but, you know, just got to control it. That's all we can do, not let it get to you. Dr. Romero said I'm going to be here for a few years. Yeah. Few years? A few years. How do you feel about that? I don't mind. You don't mind? No. I'm here for a reason. All right. It's getting better, isn't it? So, mm. that means I've got to stay a couple of years, mm. then so be it. But, I'm getting there now. You get I have a blip, mm -hmm. but at least, at least there was no violence. Which is good. Which you should be proud of. At least it shows that you're making, you know, more progress. Alex's mental state continued to deteriorate. After a couple of weeks on the ward, he did self-harm and had to be moved back to a high dependency ward. Okay. On Chepstow Ward, Dr. Larkin wants to discuss a recent incident involving Lenny and another doctor. I was saying that I was really pleased that they're now starting to track and find paedophiles in our society, how pleased I was, and that they weren't just ordinary poor folk that were getting nicked, it was also people who were important who were getting found out. Okay. And I'm really pleased about that. And she felt threatened that I was saying it also included a couple of doctors that were nicked for paedophilia. You're not angry with her about something in her report? No, I wasn't angry with her. It wasn't, it wasn't directed towards her. It was directed towards the general idea of paedophilia. Because you know, you know I am a victim of paedophilia for nine years under the Home Office yeah. when I was a child myself. And they've done nothing but um, bury that fact. Because though I'm an offender, I am an offender and admit that. I'm, I'm guilty of the crime that brought me to Broadmoor. I threatened to kill a Section 12 consultant psychiatrist like you are with a machete. But I'm not guilty of raping myself. Well, I think the issue was that you felt nobody here was competent. No, I was, being, I was being tied up, right? Raped against my wall, alcohol shoved down my throat, 
right? Pacify with, 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 with all kinds of ch uh, med medicines that belong to that person, yeah, not me, so that I would be pliable and agree to having sex, which I didn't want to do. As a five, six year old boy, right? Nine years I was in the, I was in the, in the system itself, being seen as a psychologist at the same time of being raped, and nobody did a single thing to help me. You're offering me therapy, and I'm not, I'm not angry at you. I'm not angry at anybody. I'm angry at the people that did what they did to me. But we've never recognised that I was a victim. So, are we agreeing that you're going to meet with David about options for therapy for you as a victim? Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Larkin. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I've got to keep, if I keep trouble for it, if I keep out of trouble for, for, for 12 weeks, yeah. they'll let me work in the calf. Yes. You think you can do that? It'd be hard, but I'll, I'll give it a try. The most challenging patients are housed here on Cranfield Ward. Any movement outside their rooms has to be carefully planned. Violence is always near the surface. Patients are allowed, one by one, in the yard for limited periods. A patient doesn't want to return to his room. Okay. His primary nurse, Mo, has already given him an extra 30 minutes. It's a planned intervention to relocate him to his room because um, his presentation dictates that he could put up a fight. Do you feel he's a bit unstable? Yeah, very. Yeah. Because he's, um, he's quite threatening and verbally abusive at the minute. Yeah. Mo puts on a camera to record the planned intervention in the event of any violence. On the intensive care ward, staff are preparing to move a reluctant patient back to his room from the yard. Fucking release me! Fucking release me, man! I'm going home and we're leaving six people, so we need to go. One, two, three, five, six. It's a lot of people to take. Yeah, we'll take you down. In six of us will take you down. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we go? Because the need is to go home. Go home then, isn't it? I'm not troubling you. We need to be ready now because we are ready. Yeah, turn around. So turn around, turn around for us. Right. Yeah. Right. Let's feed that hand through there to me. Don't worry, we'll do exactly the same. Relax, 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 relax. Relax, relax. Bring that hand to the side. Bring your next hand to the back. Go on, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. Nice, thank you. Right, move. Right up. Nice and relax, yeah, right? The hospital has forbidden us from showing this restraint procedure, even with the patient disguised, on the grounds that he doesn't have capacity to consent. His voice has been replaced by an actor's. Well known for kicking staff, the patient is asked to remove his shoes. As predicted, he lashes out. The eight staff members get the patient onto the floor for everyone's safety. They're outside his room. It's back on the floor and a final manoeuvre to get him safely through the door. Once in the room, the patient is placed on the bed feet furthest from the door. Then one nurse will keep hold of his legs, another his arms and a third his head. They let go and exit one by one. The last to let go is holding his head and nearest to the door.
Whenever force has to be used, staff take time out to reappraise. So I've been um, verbally abusive and threatening. Are you okay? Clenching his fist, swearing. The minute mm -hmm. present in that manner, you know he's going to fight. Mm -hmm. so, you know, you can't predict these things. We did our best to try and manage it. But the most important thing is that everybody is safe and the procedures were followed very well. And the patient himself is not harmed or injured. Yeah. So that's it then, guys. Back to our jobs. That's it. That's it. Good work. Good work, team. Right. On average, there are five physical assaults a week on staff, including punching, kicking, throwing hot liquids, urine and feces. Some are serious enough to warrant the hospital pursuing criminal charges. Does that happen to you a lot? It's, yeah, it's part of, you can know, be anyone, at any anyone, time. Any, any time, you yeah. know. Mm. Obviously, you can see their, their state. Just put a bit of water <laughs> their there. mental state is very unstable. <laughs> oh, really unpredictable. Anyway, it was well managed. Yeah, mm. because at times you can get serious injuries. Mm. So Mo, is every day like this for you? Sorry? Is every day like this for you? Um, every other day. There are days when um, the world will be very settled, the patients are quiet or be in a happy mood. But not all the time because their mental state tends to subside a lot. So you were right about him though, weren't you? Yeah, of course. He's actually, I am his primary nurse, so I know him. You know, you can tell, you can see it's coming. It's about knowing your patients, we know all of them. So was he complaining about how many of you there were there? He was counting how many staff there were. He knew that we were ready for action. You know, in, in as much as they are mentally ill, but they are not stupid. Yeah, some of them, they know exactly what they're doing. It's kind of like preparing that I'm going to get them and they'll look at the team to see oh I think this is a weak team and then they'll go for it. Yeah, yeah, I'm cool. yeah. Patients like these on Cranfield can progress. They will eventually move on to other wards and, with time, even out of the hospital. You watching football on Sunday? The finals? You watching it? We'll bring you out for the uh, activity so you can watch it live, yeah? Good man. Every day there is love for you And every day we can start anew We've only got one chance in the world to get you Make a dream come true Hold on and treasure your love Many think that Broadmoor is simply the dumping ground for society's most notorious criminals, a final destination with no hope of return. Shall we move on? He's here because of the attempted murder of his mother, not terribly bright. A weekly ward meeting gives a summary of the kind of men who are kept here. The last thing he did um, was he took his MP3 player and took bits of it, uh, took the wire from it and a, a ring, a metal ring from it and tied it around his genitalia. And he did that in the middle of the night and it was only when he was in real pain that he managed to tell the member of staff. And it's not really clear why he did it. Jailed? Good man. In prison, it became clear that there was something wrong with this guy. Broadmoor is home to 200 men, each carefully assigned to one of 15 wards depending on their mental state. Oh, what's there to say about him? He's 33, index offence of murder. He's got extreme kind of borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder. He's in this hospital because in a medium secure unit, he sharpened the handle of a toothbrush and tried to stab a member of staff in the face. Patients' identities have been protected at the hospital's request. Cranfield is the intensive care ward for the hospital's most acutely mentally ill patients. 
The men here are unpredictable and violent, and the simple act of serving meals has to be carefully tailored to the individual. You all right? Chicken run. Yeah. Don't turn them. No, no he's here. Give us a chance. Yeah, put us here. Chicken schnitzel. Thank you. I didn't throw it. What? I didn't throw it. Three days on the trot. <laughs> Thank you. One of the biggest misconceptions, I think, is that those that have severe mental illnesses or those that end up in a place like Broadmoor are kind of destined to, to, to be unwell forever or to be risky forever, and that simply isn't true. The mental disorders that we treat are very amenable to treatment. It's hard to believe that men, locked up like caged tigers and only ever allowed out one by one, can ever progress. But each ward in Broadmoor is a staging post to their recovery. Where's breakfast, mate? Breakfast time on Epsom, a high dependency ward. The risk here is a little lower. That's hot, that is, mate. They brought your meds yet? Oh, well, they'll be coming in a minute. Right. All right, mate? Yeah. Patients here are allowed out to associate with each other, with plenty of staff in attendance. You can get out, man. Yeah. 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 Well, I've been on the wards, so I've seen the patients. I'm a nurse. You never lose the... This is where you want to be, really. You just have butter, yeah? Just butter. Yeah. And your day goes much quicker. It's better spending it with people that you're being paid to look after than sitting at a desk. You know, which sometimes seems somewhat meaningless. But there we are. Mm -hmm. Right, I hope that's uh, OK, Trevor. Yeah, fine. Come in with breakfast, mate. I think there's a difference between being mentally ill and not being mentally ill. And I think if you're mentally ill and you've done something that perhaps you are not in full control of at the time, you certainly, society owes you a break. And I think everybody deserves to have a bit of hope. If you have no hope, you're just going to give up. Okay, enjoy. Yeah, I have the coffee. Can I be rude and ask how old you are? I'm 40 years old. 40? Yeah. All together, I've done 20 years. 15 years here and 5 years in prison. Long time, innit? I was a, I was a child soldier. Then it's called Somalia, Somalia land. Were you? Yeah, when I was young. I had my first AK at the age of 9 years old. You know, so... Was that AK-47? AK-47, AK yeah. AK-47. Is that machine gun? No, AK-47. Is it like a rifle? Yeah, it's not a yeah. rifle. It's like a... It's, like, it's a gun. You've never seen AK-47? You've never seen AK-47? He's went on the way to uh, be referred to a certain rehab. Oh, good, yeah. And he's doing really well. Once the risk of violence to themselves or others has been reduced, a patient can move to the greater freedom of an assertive rehab ward. We all have keys for their own room. Uh, so, staff have got our override key. Adam has been on Canterbury ward for the past four years. Bed, my stereo. Before that, he spent nine years in Broadmoor in a high dependency there. ward. Um, the rooms are quite small, um, about six foot by three foot, and you can actually just about touch wall to wall, toilet in there, toilet and hand basin. The only problem with having the toilet in there is we've also got our wardrobe in there. Convicted of arson, he was seven years into a life sentence in prison when his self-harm became so acute he was moved to Broadmoor. I had a very long history of self-harm, but when I was in the prison service, it escalated to the point where I was putting my life on the line on a daily basis. I was cutting arteries, tendons, but it's like my hand. It's 
totally gone straight and um, backwards because I've got a wound here where I cut all the tendons and that. Yeah. Is that good love? It's my I had a very traumatic childhood. The way I felt was that my parents didn't love me as much as they should have. I was sexually abused by Sarah's people outside the family and because of the sexual abuse, self-harm started taking place when I was about eight years old. Um, I started off with pulling out toenails and things like that um, and I also started setting fires at that age as well. I just sort of grew up hating everybody, hating society, hating life. Self-harm was a way of me escaping all that. Adam's Broadmoor journey has been long with many setbacks, but the end is finally in sight. He's to be allowed out on trial leave to a medium secure unit 30 miles away. Here comes the boss. All is well. The constant toing and throwing of patients on this ward can make you forget you're in Broadmoor. You know, Chuck Garley's all going into one pot. But there's always the reminder that this is a high secure facility for men capable of violence. When patients take it in turns to cook, careful account has to be kept of everyday household items, especially of those that could be used as weapons. Dylan is 49. It's his second time in Broadmoor. This is how Dylan remembers his childhood. I got born into a satanic family, very, very violent. Um, in some cases, it would have been better to have killed me than to allow me to have this abominable life that I've had. Yeah. Um, my father, thankfully, he died homeless alcoholic, so he, he was the bone breaker. You know, he would really break my bones and leave me in the attic and just, that'd be it, do you know what I mean? So I had to learn pain very quickly. Yeah, do you watch that um, death row thing? I did watch this week. My father raped and beat my mother badly. In his twisted thinking, he could raise a demon from some kind of hell by raping her in the way that he did. The um, moment I was born, she freaked out and she said, oh, your eyes are evil, you're evil. And that was it, she just tried killing me. She had made me cat's food all the time. She was keeping me locked up in the attic. wasn't allowed to talk to my brothers or my sister. And my mother, she also liked the sexual abuse. Yeah, she was adamant that every single avenue of my childhood was going to be destroyed. And she'd done her best for that. Can I have a plastic spoon, please? I was pretty thin. I had to steal my food. It was fire that got me away from home eventually. By the time I reached five and six, I'd learnt the red match strike on the wall like my mother did to light the gas oven. So I took a handful of them to school for the first time I was allowed to go to um, kindergarten and I could smell the box of food, you know, and the sandwiches and all that, you know. So I scoffed my face really big, big, big time and then set fire to it. No, so she to go for a sip, man, no. Dylan was in care from the age of 7 to 18. As an adult, he became a homeless alcoholic. I, I became an arsonist, I was a violent offender, lots of drug abuse and alcohol. Yeah, unfortunately, I've done some kidnapping. A really nice couple of people, you know, never done any harm to me. I was very, very drunk, a bottle of vodka, threatened the police outside. I had the guns on me if I didn't put the, the knife down. I basically wanted them to kill me. You know, I wanted them to kill that wild, out-of-control alcoholic inside me. And I, I was inviting them to do that. And they, uh, you know, they were very, very bloody close. And I just put the knife down. 
Olive, red. It smells nice. Beautiful. I may say so myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone think I've cooked it? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else is like, Ugh. Dylan's psychiatrist is currently assessing whether he's sufficiently recovered for release from Broadmoor. Can I just say, can we all wish a very happy birthday? Well, he's reached 34 today. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Moving on from Broadmoor is a slow process. Birthdays come and go with no set date for release. Broadmoor has 800 staff. Many have been here for years despite the daily risk of assault. I hope, I hope, and off to it may be a hospital, but staff here have to have specialized training and equipment to deal with anything. From enforcing medication to managing full-scale riots. <laughs> It's unusual training for nursing staff. This team is deployed around 30 times a year, administering medication and disarming patients with weapons. Not everyone in Broadmoor is directly violent, but their behavior can nonetheless cause grave risk to others. Anthony has been on an admissions ward for five months. He's at the start of his Broadmoor journey. Is that your normal reading? No, we're forced to read out of the son of the male. But no, probably I wouldn't choose that. <laughs> it's arson that has led to Anthony's incarceration in Broadmoor. His mental health began to deteriorate at university. When I was 19, I started eating quite large amounts of cannabis resin. Um, started eating it? Yeah. I had a glimpse of what I thought on cannabis were things that could solve problems for the whole of the world. No, I became very grandiose. I believe that the sum of the total energy in the universe was God, and therefore you are God, and I'm God, and this bed is effectively God. And then uh, doing just a bizarre and unusual things like climbing bridges and surfing on trains and taking back to hospital because I drove past a, a police car when I'd been high. So, but when you say you drove past a police car, what's wrong with that? On the pavement. Ah. Anyway, during that period, somebody broke into my flat and kicked the door down and threatened me in my flat. Um, and the door whacked me in the face. After I'd been banging and making music on the window, so I'd been uh, with a, a nuisance neighbour. Uh, but uh, I didn't have a mobile phone. After he left, I barricaded the door and lit a fire in my window to try and get help. Sent to a medium secure psychiatric unit, he again became psychotic and started a fire there. This brought him to Broadmoor. He's previously been on preventative antipsychotic medication, and now his psychiatrist wants him back on it. My introduction to the mental health system was a jab full of a medication that when you wake up, you just you know, feel absolutely terrible, you can't function, you can't communicate, you can't do anything, and it effectively makes me mentally disabled. Anthony is refusing to go back on medication. My doctor, he's saying I'm well at the moment. However, he was sort of pointing out that the MOJ and probably the public in general will not accept me in the community off medication. So he's saying that if I, if, if I don't get medicated, I'm, I may never get out. Many of the patients here have a history of substance abuse, often linked to their mental illness. Therapy aims to give them the skills to resist temptation. So what we want to do is expose people to some substances today, yeah. okay? 
there. Yeah. <laughs> well, is it the real stuff though? Some of it is real, some of it isn't. So the whole 31 year old Michael is suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. He hears voices. When I first started hearing this stuff, when I was about 24, it was amazing. I couldn't believe it. I had to run out the house because I was scared. I mean, something's speaking to your head. I, you know, I, I, unheard of to me, do you understand? It might, it might have been drug induced because I was smoking cannabis heavily at the moment, but it goes more deeper than that. It smells real. Is there a face associated with the voice for you? No, nah, no, nah, just something like in my head. Nothing, nothing. It's like a living part in my head is like a, like a demonic kind of being, you understand? But now while you're talking to me, has it been talking? Well, it just called me a fool at this moment that you just mentioned it, but while I was talking, it wasn't saying nothing. But then I mentioned it, I came to think of it and it just called me, um, yeah. I know it's hard to believe unless you live with it, but it's just, it's just like having a conscious being in your head. Learn to live with it. While medication has diminished Michael's voices, it hasn't eradicated them. How confident are you not to use? Eight. An eight. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, I would like to be at the, at the top end of this girl. Mukhtar has been in Broadmoor for two years. It's been the most stable period of his life so far. I've never seen my mum. Never seen my mum, you know. She's um, supposed to be in America. No. You've never seen her your whole I've life? I've never seen her my whole life. I've tried to find her, but um, that's the difficult part because I don't even know her full name. Mukhtar ran away from foster care when he was 16 and became involved in street gangs and started selling drugs. He didn't realize he was also becoming mentally ill. I've had a lot of stress. I've had a lot of stress. I kept on hearing voices and I kept on attacking people and I kept on being erratic behavior. A rival gang warned him off their territory. Mukhtar says his drug supplier gave him a gun and told him to deal with them. Holding a weapon, my first time, and, and it felt like, that like, whoa. To some extent, it did feel like, you know, that like I'm dangerous now. But on the other hand, it felt like I'm vulnerable as well, you know? Armed with a gun, Mukhtar returned to the estate. And my intentions were going to fire a gun in the air. I would certainly run off, but these people didn't run off. They chased me to the block of flats. Now I'm cornered. They attacked me, hitting me with knuckle dusters. One of them got the gun like that and pulled it like, to try and take it off my hand. I was scared. I was thinking I'm going to get killed here. So as he grabbed the gun and he pulled it away from me, I just remember bam, here and bam, and, and my finger pulling the trigger. And um, it's the worst, worst experience I've ever had. How old were you? I was just turned 18, January. Just turned 18. Found guilty of manslaughter, Mukhtar was sent to Broadmoor under a hospital order. I didn't know the place. I didn't know nothing about it. I was being told about medication and everything that I'm going to take. I said, I don't need medication. After my first dose, I understood that my voice started to reduce in intensity. And that's when I realized that, look, something is happening now. No? It was, it was a different, it was different. Mukhtar is focusing on his recovery and hopes to go to university someday. Listen, it was a long time ago and I can't even remember how I came to the streets But I remember the older shouting out when I switched on the other kids He's ruthless, he's devilish, he's a born killer 
If I knew what I know now, I wouldn't be ruthless, I wouldn't be a sinner, forget that I'll be a born winner. I got locked up at a young age, it was due to a mistake that I made, but all is not lost, cause I'm here now, I'm gonna rise above the clouds, I'm gonna, what is my dream? I dream of reality, so why are you mad at me? I'm just trying to be reunited with my family. Like everything in Broadmoor, getting in and out takes time and follows a strict protocol. Yes, uh, Alpha, that's all received. You're clear to move. Hiya. Escorted by nurses, Adam has been out to visit the medium secure unit he's hoping to move to within the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm so it didn't go as well as I thought it would. Yeah. Oh, the person whose bed I'm waiting for, who should have had Edmo J permission, hasn't got it, and everything's changed and everything gone tips up. So there's going to be no movement for at least two to three months. So. Adam's been here for 13 years. He thought he was leaving in a week. Now it could be months. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, November 5. You're clear to move. It's off, stand by. It's a big disappointment. Yeah, it wasn't a very good day. More I did, the more depressed I got. And I, in the end, I came in here, and then I just ended up screaming, shouting, crying. I started throwing things at my daughter way to say, look, get in here now, because I'm just about to do something. But I'm still screaming and shouting, quite hysterical. Normally when I throw things, I get up, pick the bits up and do something with them. You know, and I didn't this time, so that's another thing that shows how far I come. Oh, you mean you use the bits to help yeah. yourself? Not a normal thing to do, 40 year old fairy things about, but I had to do what I needed to do to get my head out of that situation, to, you know, to show that I was in pain and angry and stuff like that. Wasn't but you didn't self harm? I didn't self harm that time, which I got a lot of praise for. If Adam does self-harm, he'll jeopardise his chances of transfer out of Broadmoor. In Broadmoor, staff rely on knowing their patients well enough to be aware of what's going on in their heads. They call it relational security. This patient believes the hospital is trying to poison him. Hi. I was going to ask you the same question. I'm very well. Just, just to kick off. There are several staff that I can smell a bad order coming from when they hand me something. So can they use blood basically? That's what I'm saying. It depends on what it is. Well, anything. No, if it's, if it's food stuff, so no, that's fine, but no, they're not going to be wearing gloves. <laughs> Scrooge. What else is on your list? Towel. They give my flannels. I'm not going to smell. I don't know what to say to that. To be honest with you, I've had enough experiences. Like you've had enough. Okay, so maybe we'll Every back single to day, seeing doing the same thing, seeing the same people day in, day out. It's just madness. The thing is, that whilst we're here, all they ever talk about is RSU, RSU, RSU. Every single second, every single minute, every single hour, day, year, year out. The way out of Broadmoor is usually along a winding road that eventually leads to a regional secure unit, or RSU. They're found in towns up and down the country. And whilst you do get an RSU, all they'll talk about is, listen, you carry where you are, you go straight to Broadmoor. Mm. So then they're first in Broadmoor. Then you come back to Broadmoor. Oh, so if you can't be in yourself, you're doing well. You're going to go off you soon. Simon has been moving between high and medium dependency wards within Broadmoor for some years. Well, are we saying something about the difficulty of being here? I'm going to absconch. 
Ertek peşmi yapma ağır şey. Zaman sonra güyüne peşmi yok. Ben artık ne kadar sordum. Ama ilk bakın şimdi bu. Avalı ne yapar işçi? Akış da bir anlayı. Blokçı bir fayn kendine işte o. Ancak işte çarşı da yapar işçi. Ben artık çöyü bu adet işçi. Ben çöyü de. Ben sonra bir şey bu anlayı var o. How are you? I don't know what to say, um, it's been alright. Right. I don't know what they're like, been laughing all day, I don't know what the guy's laughing about. Uh, I, I do find it irritating at the moment, but I'm laughing about it. That's rude. There's nothing funny about that, do you understand? It's only rude, man. Come and believe yourself, man. There's laughter and there's inappropriate laughter. Yeah. If somebody's sharing some serious things, <laughs> then I think you're laughing at them. You know I mean? That's paranoia. You just gotta be mindful of that. <laughs> <laughs> A few weeks later, Simon attacked a nurse on his medium dependency ward. He's due to return to high dependency. It's a step backwards. So he's been here before, you know him? Yes, yeah, it's his third time back, yeah. But he likes it on here. He likes the staff and he likes the structure, so that's why he wants to come back. So some days when he wakes up, he'll say, he'll say that I'm Turkish today. And then the next day he'll be Greek. <laughs> so he's quite funny. But yeah, no, you can have a laugh at him, which is good. He is one of the funnier ones of the crew. You all right? Time to get on there. They're collecting Simon from the seclusion area in Chepstow Ward, where he's been kept since the incident. Get yourself ready, you come with me and trip. He's threatened to attack more staff and needs the restrictive regime of a high dependency ward. Job, job then. Shake a leg, mate, come on. Let's go back to the door, yeah. Yeah. Back to the door. That's it. Hands behind your back, mate. Well done. Come right back, then. Come back, then. Get your trainers on. Get your trainers on. Sorry, all day. It's a walk through ten locked doors to move him to another ward in the same building. We don't like to see anybody coming back. But it's, it's, it's a quick fix. I mean, we get him back into the structure, um, restart him on his medication, get him stabilised again. Then, then I'm, I'm hoping that he will only be back here for a matter of weeks, and then we'll progress him back to Chepstow, and that'll be his pathway route out of Broadmoor. Isn't it dangerous wearing a tie? No, it's a clip-on tie. So uh, anti-strangle. <laughs> I'm not allowed light on. For many of Broadmoor's patients, there's stability to be found in the strict routine of an institution. It may also be the first time they've been looked after, had regular meals, and consistent interaction with others. It's easy to be bad. There's no rules to be bad. But there are a billion rules to be good. But I'm learning. I'm learning. Dylan was a homeless alcoholic for years and ended up living in a forest foraging for food. That was lovely. He's been on an assertive rehab ward for four years. He's hoping his psychiatrist will let him move on. I do believe that you... You continue to need treatment yeah. in hospital, yeah. okay? In that respect, um, my view is that you still have a mental disorder, yeah. um, you know, personality disorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing is that the team, yeah. we do not believe that you need to continue this treatment in uh, high security. I'm still cautious, I think I still believe that you need treatment in conditions yeah, of security. I, yeah. Anything else then? Uh, 
No, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really just keeping it, keeping it. I'm getting old now, you know. I, I haven't got time for all this sort. Of what, what, what do you mean by old? <laughs> getting old. Anybody who's younger I'm, than me. Is young. <laughs> Say it goes, I'm not the only gay in the village. Um, I know who I am. I know what I've done in the past. You know, I'm a 40-year-old gay man living in a psychiatric hospital. People can't accept that for what I am, and that's their problem. That's not mine. You know, um, I just try to make lemonade out of lemon. Best situation out of a bad situation. <laughs> Adam's still waiting for a date for his transfer to a medium secure unit. Hello! What time is it, Tommy? The time is uh, 25 minutes past two. 25 past four? Two. 22 past four? What's the time? 25 minutes past two. 25 past four? Two. Past four. All right, if you see this, four. if you say so. Four. If it came between you leaving and you taking medication, what would you do? Well, you then force medication. What, me personally? Or, the team. or just as a team? Downstairs and still stuck on the admissions ward, Anthony continues to question his need for medication. We want to make sure that the person that would giving medication to, needs it. You're right, no, I'm just doing the checks, okay? Not a big question. On the, at the moment, I've got capacity to make decisions, yeah. apparently, according mm -hmm. to the doctor. Do you think that mental health patients should be able to, while they're well, choose the treatment? I think one of the biggest cruelties of mental health conditions like psychosis is that often the first thing that will disappear is that understanding that your own behaviour and your own thoughts are actually being impacted upon by your mental health. You say that my risk to the public. And without that insight, it is very, very difficult to persuade anyone that they need treatment. So if you can imagine yourself in a situation where somebody is telling you that you're unwell, or you don't think so, and then they're trying to persuade you to have a medication that might make you sedated or it might make you put on weight, that's not an easy conversation to have with somebody. We don't force injections on people just because we haven't got anything else to do that day. Sure. There's no, lots of other, approach. no, but there's lots of other things that we look in just like you do. But you agree that medication is forced on some patients just as a prophylactic, just to stop them becoming one of the I'm future. not agreeing to that side of it. But it's, I'm not would you to say that, that doesn't happen? I, I am saying there are times when we have to give people medication because they've become a risk to themselves. Yeah, so what's so say because their mental health is, is deteriorated, but I'm not discussing other patients, we're discussing okay, so, so, Can you walk with me so I can yeah, do so, and make so sure I'm everyone well. else is okay? I'm well. Adam's got the news he's been waiting for. His bed in the medium secure unit is finally available. I don't want to let my family down, I don't want to let myself down. I don't want to let other people know I'm in here. I'm glad he's going and it's nice for him to go in. In a way it's a bit sad as well because like, we've been on the same water for nearly four years, so. Could be missed, but he won't be to go. Could have stood by and he could have been thin really on the board. When I had my own problems on the board and that, he stood by and then helped me out and did a lot of things for me and looked after me. And, you know, and I try to look after it, but... You just drove me mad with CDs. Uh, <laughs> well, not that bad, but... It's his final evening, and time for a last movie with his mate. It's looking for the Lopez. There's a lot of films lately. Do you have to stay um, outside in the corridor? Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> I will miss this place. It's been my home for nearly 40 years. I know people don't like us calling it home, but it is home. Do I have to close my door? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Anthony's condition had been stable, but a few days ago he was forcibly medicated following an incident on the ward when he refused to return to his room and threw himself on the floor singing prayers. Best thing is if we start off with your perspective on things. His brother and his solicitor are attending a meeting to discuss his care. And yes, I was singing and I was argumentative, ended up in the seclusion room, then stripped forcefully um, and then medicated. I slept for um, two nights and, and all those symptoms have gone. I think that's worth noting. Okay, so you recognise you were psychotic for a period of time? Um, yes. Yeah. The conclusion that we have arrived at is that it would be appropriate for you to have prophylactic antipsychotics. Is it um, best practice according to that I'm involved within this decision making process? I think your views about medication are very well known to the team. Why do you believe that I am so anxious? Well, I know that you experience it to be uncomfortable, but... Uncomfortable? Uh, it's, it is torment. It's, uh, it's uh, the, 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 the debilitating effect of not being able to communicate, to be able to have internal anguish and uh, frustrations and uh, no longer be able to converse with the people that you love and you lose all your friendships, you become isolated you can, and then you've got the, 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 the physical side effects. You don't want to look good, your hair, your hair goes flat and greasy, your skin gets away before you, you put on weight, you get starey eyes, everybody knows you're on medication and sum it up as discomfort, I think is a little bit, um, maybe not. I know that you are distressed by the, the sort of medication. Mm -hmm. Everyone can hear that, but the, the trouble is we have a bit of a knack of spending so much time on that, that we lose time to help you with other things. And we need, whilst hearing what you want to say about that, because it's important, not having that be the only thing we ever talk with you about. His lack of cooperation is likely to prolong his time in Broadmoor. After a second psychotic episode, Anthony started taking medication. He's been allowed to move to an assertive rehab ward. Following his psychiatrist's recommendation that he be kept in less secure conditions, Dylan is going to a mental health tribunal to see if they will agree. I have totally outgrown being in Baltimore. Okay, I've done my medication, I've done my five groups, I've done everything. Let's see the next stage now, you know, give me a little bit of hope. You know, so, because I'm a one-man band, I don't have family outside or nothing. So if I give up, that's it, it's, no one's going to pick me up and say, well, look, come on. Usually, the tribunal is over quickly and with everyone in agreement. Well, um, I don't go in there expecting anything, but I've been allowed to uh, be conditionally discharged to an um, MSU. And I'm leaving ten times better person than I ever have been. And that, my friend, is something all those people that have done bad things to me in their past will never see. I've broken the chain. Baltimore well, served its purpose. <laughs> I don't need you now, more, more, more. <laughs> Adam is finally leaving Broadmoor, and Leanne, the hospital's director, has come to say goodbye. Goodbye, good luck. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All the best. And you. Okay? Yeah. Don't come back. I won't. All right, right then. Yeah. Cheers. Bye, Leah. Bye. That's nice for her to come down. Good job, Michelle. Thank you. Bye.
Don't get too stressed out. Don't let this place drag you down. Right, excuse me. Then. I'm right, producer. See you later, alright? Yeah, take care. Good luck. I'll oh. give you that. Thank you. And I'll give you this. I have the key ring because that's my own. Bye bye, room. Do very well. I think on behalf of the team, we're really proud of you. We are really proud of you. Good luck. Yeah, and we mean that. Alright, okay. Don't come back. Alright. Well, best of luck, yeah? Yeah. Take care again. Take care. Alright, who is that? Oh, no! <laughs> Bye, I'm going! Bye! Adam is now on trial leave from the hospital. In the event of an incident, he could be recalled at any time. This has been the first, and quite possibly the last chance to see inside Broadmoor Hospital in its current form. The lives of today's patients will continue nearby, where a new hospital is under construction. These old Victorian buildings have witnessed the troubled lives of so many over Broadmoor's 150 year history. Now, there's talk of turning them into a hotel. <laughs>